Shubhra Batra, and on behalf of Team IntelliCab, I would like to welcome all of you to day three of Sankalp Global Summit and to this session on financing in the water sanitation and hygiene sector. Thank you so much for joining us today. With access to finance being one of the key challenges in uh, catalyzing private sector participation in the wash space, there is a dire need to design innovative financing mechanisms for enterprises working in this sector. And for that, we have brought together today a stellar group of WASH funders who will talk about WASH financing facilities they have designed and implemented across Asia and Africa, and will also share learnings from their experiences with all of us. Our session today is divided into two parts. We will first showcase four WASH financing facilities, which together form a great mix across geographies, sub-segments within WASH, different types of capital being provided, direct as well as indirect lending, and which have been creating impact at various levels. We will then move on to a moderated discussion about learnings from these facilities. Let me introduce uh, our speakers to all of you. Our moderator, Mr. Apur Shukla, is a development finance specialist at USAID India, where he supports the mission to amplify its development impact using innovative financing models. He is currently leading the deployment and management of innovative financing instruments such as pay for performance, partial credit guarantees and other blended, blended finance instruments across healthcare, WASH, education, and various other sectors. Mr. Antoine Reyes is a senior equity investment manager at Incofin, a global impact investing manager specialized in emerging markets. He has been doing private equity investments for the past 15 years with focus on Asia, Africa, and Latin America. With Incofin, he specializes in equity investments for SMEs active in the value chain of water, to support entrepreneurs scaling access to affordable and safe drinking water for underserved populations. Ms. Meena Jessing has over 25 years of financial services experience across SME banking, where she led key functions such as strategic planning, team management, project appraisals, financial analysis, and business development for banks and other FIs. At Swakarma, she is Chief Partnership Officer and has built a WASH portfolio lending to MSMEs and microfinance institutions. Ms. Shabana Abbas, is lead innovative finance at Aqua for All, a Dutch not-for-profit grant-making organization working on enabling access to safe drinking water and sanitation in Asia and Africa. In this role, Shabana leverages her 12 plus years of experience in the water sector and her background in economics and finance to begin to design and implement innovative innovate, uh, impact finance programs to support scaling of growth stage social enterprises. Lastly, Mr. Sridhar Sampath is a finance professional with 32 years of experience spanning development finance, impact investment, commercial banking, equity investments, and consulting. He is currently the regional director for South Asia at Water Equity and is responsible for Water Equity's investments in South Asia, end to end, starting from sourcing business, negotiating terms, carrying out due diligence, getting investment committee approvals, and overseeing documentation disbursement, as well as portfolio monitoring. Thank you to all our esteemed speakers for joining us today and welcome. Let me now hand over to our moderator, Mr. Apur Shukla, for his opening remarks. Apur, over to you. Thanks a lot, Shubhra. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for that kind introduction for everyone and really setting the broader agenda around uh, the facility. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure uh, uh, to be here, uh, to uh, be moderating and facilitating this discussion on a very important topic around water sanitation and hygiene financing. Uh, I'm going to just spend a few minutes uh, before we get into uh, the, the, the weeds of some of these uh, really innovative facilities and presentations that we have lined up for you on just setting the larger uh, context of water and sanitation financing. So let me begin by saying that, you know, access to clean water, sanitation and hygiene, while being a very important end in itself, uh, is also very critical and touches upon other aspects of uh, human development like uh, health and nutrition, uh, education, uh, economic well-being uh, for communities around the world. And sadly, as per estimates, uh, as we all know, uh, you know, a large chunk of uh, the global population does not have access to, uh, you know, clean water, sanitation and hygiene services. Numbers such as, you know, almost one third of the population does not have access, uh, one, one third of the global population does not have access to safety managed drinking water services and lack the uh, access to basic hygiene services. And almost double of that, uh, you know, almost 3.5, 3.6 billion do not have access to safety managed uh, sanitation services, really inhibiting, uh, uh, you know, these communities and populations to achieve their full potential. 
for USAID, uh, you know, we've uh, been working in the wash uh, uh, space uh, to improve water and sanitation outcomes, uh, not only in India, but across the globe in over 40 countries and have, uh, you know, over the last many decades partnered with many uh, uh, organizations uh, and stakeholders ranging from governments, uh, uh, you know, other multilateral bilateral donors, other philanthropic donors, and private sector, including uh, commercial financial institutions. And, you know, uh, I think it's for everyone to see that, you know, massive efforts have been made over the last uh, many years. And, you know, a good bit of progress has also been made in improving some of these water and sanitation um, uh, outcomes uh, across the globe. Notably, even in India, uh, you know, uh, over the last six or seven years, we've made significant progress in improving access to sanitation facilities through the impetus that the Swachh Bharat mission gave and now are accelerating more on the water side also with uh, the impetus from the Jal Jeevan mission that was launched by the government. Um, you know, uh, this progress, like I said, is definitely very heartening to see, but we still have a long way to go uh, to achieve uh, the sustainable development goal six of, uh, you know, access to clean water and sanitation for all. And I think among other things, one key uh, gap that still continues to remain is uh, the financing gap, depending on which estimates we want to look at uh, uh, or believe, uh, and, you know, there's clearly hundreds of billions of dollars of funding gap uh, uh, across the globe annually uh, to achieve uh, SDG 6 by 2030. And, you know, it's fair to say that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, that gap has probably even, uh, you know, widened uh, even more. While, you know, I think we believe that uh, public financing, uh, you know, through governments stepping up their budgets, uh, as well as, uh, you know, financing for philanthropic donors, multilateral, bilaterals, uh, you know, overseas development assistance will continue to play uh, an important role uh, in bridging this financing gap. I think a significant private sector investment uh, will be needed to actually, you know, uh, get us to the finish line. Um, and I think uh, given the uniqueness uh, that the water and sanitation uh, sector is, and, you know, in some cases, like in India, for at least some of the sub sectors, the nascent stage uh, that the sector is in, private capital providers face, uh, you know, a lot of challenges in investing into WASH, you know, some of them being high perceived risk of, uh, uh, investment, uh, incomplete market information, or, you know, just a limited understanding of the water and sanitation space, which is, you know, to be honest, quite complex. Uh, on the, you know, supply side, uh, low enterprise capacity, uh, you know, high dependence of enterprises on government receivables, given that in most countries, it's, uh, you know, uh, it still tends to be heavily regulated and controlled by the government, given that these are public goods. You know, overall leading to probably fewer investable business models, uh, you know, just to name a few of the challenges that the private sector faces. And I want to go back to what uh, Shubra said, and I think blended and innovative finance have a huge role to play in actually, uh, you know, uh, helping solve some of these critical challenges for uh, uh, the private sector to invest into WASH. And I think some of the facilities that we'll see over the next half an hour or so will uh, really uh, exemplify that and show us how it's being done across uh, the globe. And before I pass it uh, back over to Shubra to get us into the presentation, I do want to, you know, uh, reiterate two themes that we've heard uh, in a big way over the last two or three days at Sankalp and I think are very, very important to solve, uh, you know, many facilitated uh, development challenges that we face today collaboration and innovation. And I think some of the uh, facilities and the presentations that you see and this session overall really exemplifies those two themes. And we'll see more of that collaboration uh, of uh, for putting together these facilities among different types of stakeholders, including governments, uh, prime, uh, you know, impact investors, concessional capital players, uh, uh, commercial lenders, implementing partners, technical assistance providers, and innovation in designing uh, financial instruments and operating and deploying financial instruments. Uh, and I really look, look forward to the presentations and then uh, getting back uh, uh, for an interesting panel discussion to unpack some of those uh, presentations. Without uh, further ado then, I would like to pass uh, it back to Shubra to uh, lead us into the presentations now. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Apoor. Thank you so much for that. 
Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Antoine to talk about uh, Incofin's experience at the Water Access Acceleration Fund. Over to you, Antoine. Thank you, Shabra. I'm waiting for my slides to display. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, um, good afternoon and uh, maybe uh, recon morning for some of you. So, I'm very honored to be with you today and I have the opportunity to introduce the Water Access Acceleration Fund. Uh, to this audience. So my name is uh, Antoine Rice. I'm Senior Equity Investment Manager at Incofin, uh, based in Cambodia, and I lead the execution of transactions in the water space for South and Southeast Asia. Um, happy to give you a quick snapshot on our efforts to accelerate access to safe and affordable drinking water in Asia and Africa. The next slide, please. So to give you uh, some words of context of who we are, so we are uh, Incofin, a global impact investor uh, with two decades of, in of experience in emerging markets, um, headquartered in Europe, and in this regard, a licensed asset manager following the EU Alternative Investment Fund regulation. We have uh, more than 1 billion euros of asset management and are supported by a, a diversified base of asset owners. Uh, some of them displayed on the bottom left corner, uh, ranging from development finance institutions, so public money, um, as well as uh, private investors such as insurance companies, banks, and other strategic partners. We have been focusing on three key pillars. Uh, financial inclusion is one, then agriculture, food, and nutrition. And we added more recently a third pillar that is water. Um, capital deployed so far was made through three types of instruments, so senior loans, equity, and uh, technical assistance. And as you will see on the map, we are a global team with people based in Bogota, Nairobi, and we have two offices in India and uh, Phnom Penh, uh, where I'm based. The next slide, please. So why are we here today is to give you a snapshot on a blended finance uh, equity facility dedicated for water investments. And we've been partnering with the international beverage and food company Danone to invest in water businesses and target populations of below $8 a day in Asia and Africa. Um, we, we are very happy uh, about this partnership as we leverage on the investment experience of Danone since 2007 that has been uh, setting up a facility to incubate social businesses focused on nutrition and water in an early stage of development. So after a long time of experience on the ground, there's still an increasing appetite in the water sector and that it could be the time to catalyze more investors so not anymore to incubate, but also to accelerate. And this is a focus of the WAF and the partnership that, that we are in. So Danone is an in core investor uh, alongside other public and private investors. And we leverage on our expertise at Incofin of managing funds uh, to deploy capital and water business. Next slide, please. So the, the WAF, uh, as it's called, targets um, a fund size of 50 million euros to provide equity and quasi-equity instruments in water business. So for instance, if water companies are lacking of capital to invest in their growth, uh, we put this capital at play to help the company scale to the next level. And to enhance the value proposition, we also recognize that equity alone is not enough. So we will uh, mobilize a technical assistance facility to fix some identified problems in companies' operations. Uh, for that, we take significant minority stakes and therefore act as shareholders becoming part of the decision making. Um, our tickets um, will range from typically five, uh, three to five million euros. So we recognize that these tickets are quite significant, uh, but we are able to structure these tickets in follow on investments to be able to let our investees absorb in a progressive manner uh, the funding they need. Um, our capital is patient, and we are investing with an horizon of five to seven years in three types of business that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. So safe water enterprises, so so-called kiosk and water ATMs, then water technology companies, and the third pillar is decentralized type infrastructure. Next slide, please. So um, impact investing is obviously in our DNA, uh, having done that for the past two decades. Um, our key aim is to put the concept of impact investing at execution into reality. So for that, our focus is to reach both uh, financial and impact objectives and demonstrate that equity in water is a viable option to catalyze appetite for the sector for more traditional investors. So on the impact side, of course, our facilities aim to contribute to SDG 6, to tracking millions of people that will have access to uh, safe water. 
uh, and uh, also the number of millions of meters uh, that will be made available. But we wish to be a bit more ambitious in that and making sure that the water is affordable as well and track gender aspects because without the need to carry water on long distance, uh, women, for instance, can instead earn an income or potentially go to school. And this is also true, we'll need to back uh, green solutions and uh, we'll track CO2 reductions by avoiding the boiling of water alongside many other aspects uh, that the fund uh, will, will track. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, I would like to uh, finish by sharing um, some key learnings encountered when setting up the initiative. So first, we, we, we want to act as the right partner in the value chain of water to be there when there is a, a need to balance between affordability and financial sustainability, serving as a complementary bridge uh, of the non-profit grant model, and also be partners of the public sector, working alongside local utilities, sometimes in public-private partnership. And uh, more importantly, we want also to raise uh, leverage on the pandemic uh, momentum to raise awareness and in fact behavioral uh, change towards uh, consumption of water. Um, secondly, we, we feel the importance of providing a solution that is adapted to water businesses and, and the reality of the development stage of the sector that did not yet benefit from access to long-term capital. So we believe that Telos equity instruments will help addressing financial capacity, um, address valuation issues and potential exit risk. And we will also provide hands-on governance working side by side with water businesses to help support them with our expertise. And lastly, the third pillar is to reinforce the water sector by catalyzing capital and reinforcing ecosystem. So we seek to unlock growth by bringing to better public and private investors around the table. And maybe even more importantly, we want to uh, make sure that, um, that we, we create a sustainable and replicable model for successor initiatives and participate to the ecosystem as a whole in a sector that will drastically need long-term capital. So that was in a nutshell what I wanted to introduce you today. Uh, this facility is aimed both for water entrepreneurs who have difficulties to scale the business and would need additional funding, but also to potential investors and partners that could become part of the ecosystem of the WAF and like us, are uh, willing to improve access to drinking water. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, Antoine. You were right on time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, that was very helpful. Just one quick request to the audience. Uh, any questions for Antoine and the speakers coming on uh, moving forward, please do add to the chat box and we will take this up uh, towards the end of the uh, you know, session. All right, I'd now like to invite Meenal uh, from Swakarma to talk about uh, their experience of the USAID uh, credit guarantee for WASH. Meenal, you're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Shubra. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm Meenal. I would like to thank IntelliCap as well as uh, Sankal Global Summit for inviting uh, me here to share my experiences or Swakarma's experiences with USAID Guarantee. Uh, what is it that uh, you know, the Guarantee has helped us to do? What are the challenges that we have faced? And uh, what is it that we want to do at go ahead? What is the way forward? Uh, so I would just like to begin with a brief introduction about Swakarma Finance. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Swakarma Finance is an impact-focused NBFC, and it was founded by a team of professionals with extensive experience in banking and financial services. The vision is to empower entrepreneurs by democratizing access to capital and knowledge. So the target customers that we cater to are underserved but commercially viable microenterprises. And we follow the principle of purpose-based lending, focusing on customers' business requirements and cash flow primarily. The main channel of delivery is through the marketplace branches and relationship managers. Also beyond access to finance, uh, we also try and help these enterprises become scalable and sustainable by providing them knowledge, support, and market linkages through a network of partners. So that's in brief about Swakarma. Uh, I would now like to talk about the uh, USAID guarantee that is in place. Um, so the USAID guarantee uh, brings in a lot of uh, additionality to all the beneficiaries. 
uh, I'll just talk about the specific features of the guarantee, but what is what it does to the beneficiary is what I would like to talk about first. So the most important thing is, is the additionality. It allows the lenders to take additional risk, create a new loan product, offer improved loan terms or lend to a new sector. So that is precisely what it has helped us do. But uh, before that, a brief about that guarantee. The guarantee was signed in September 2019 uh, when we decided to uh, move ahead with our, uh, you know, our wash journey, as you can say. The purpose is to encourage uh, enterprises and the uh, to finance enterprises in the water and sanitation and hygiene sector. Uh, how it works is that it covers 50% of the net principal lo losses of for the beneficiaries. Uh, the total guarantee amount is actually $82 million. I think this is the uh, presentation is, is a little dated, but it's $82 million, where $72 million is with the, uh, is between uh, Indusind Bank and Svakarma. $10 million is with the uh, Caspian Investment Funds. Now, each of these institutions, uh, you know, brings in their own value add expertise in the sector. So, Indusind would have the capability to look at loans with the higher ticket size loans, you know, that require longer tenure. Caspian would focus on the middle of the spectrum and Swakarma would deal with the granular or the lower ticket size exposure in the sector. So, each institution covering the entire uh, gamut of uh, lending, you know, products in the sector. Um, also, uh, I would just like to touch upon uh, what is covered under the guarantee. So what are the qualifying loans? What are, you know, who are the qualifying borrowers? Just a little bit about that. So in the water space, if you see, it is, it is basically the water provisions, uh, uh, you know, companies which are there. So it could be for supply of water. It could be uh, for vending machines or any other form of residential or community drinking water supply, then there could be companies which are engaged in water purification or water quality testing. So these include companies which are undertaking desalination and wastewater treatment projects. Then under sanitation could be the toilet manufacturing companies which are permanent or which, which either manufacture permanent bio toilets or portable toilets. Then there is a whole gamut of uh, fecal sludge management industry, which is there, which includes transportation and treatment of municipal liquid waste, which is sewage as well as septage, and it also includes sewage reuse. Under hygiene, what is covered would be the uh, you know companies which are engaged in or entities which are engaged in improving knowledge and practices related to proper menstrual hygiene, um, and also sanitary napkin manufacturing uh, entities. Entities which bring about behavior change activities that promotes and sustains community level ODF free status. Also, what gets covered are companies which are offering ONM services as well as service provider to the companies engaged in the wash sector. So, for example, the EPC contractor would also get covered. Uh, uh, even loans to financial intermediaries for on lending to customers which are undertaking wash projects and or investing in, in water and sanitation solutions uh, would get covered under this guarantee. So what is not included, I just want to, you know, uh, do a quick this thing on, on what is not included are the large scale sewage treatment plants, as well as industrial level water purification projects which do not qualify. Also, companies which are focusing on solid waste, steel waste, and medical waste uh, uh, would not get uh, covered under this guarantee. But the smaller conventional STPs, which are up to 30 MLD, or uh, you know the desalination projects, which are up to 30 MLD, with smaller chemical recovery projects, are permitted under this guarantee. Um, so this is this is basic about uh, what the uh, USA guarantee brings about. Who are the beneficiaries? What are the projects that get qualified? Um, Next slide, please. So depending upon uh, our experience with this guarantee and our experience of uh, working in this space, we try to innovate some products in this, uh, in this uh, wash space. And we came up, depending upon what was the requirement, we came up with three kind of projects, uh, pro products. One was the wash loan to micro entrepreneurs because as, as a institution we are dealing mainly with uh, with micro enterprises and that is what we wanted to focus on 
So these loans would typically be of a low, lower tenor, higher interest rate, uh, but these are more granular in nature and would cover uh, the, uh, the companies which are mainly dealing with uh, manufacturing or retail or distribution of maybe sanitary hardware products which are into uh, manufacturing of sanitary napkins or even for water, mainly you know, distribution of water or, uh, uh, or other water-related activities. Um, so we have, through our branch network, uh, tried to, uh, you know, fund these kind of entities. We funded a sanitary manufacturer. We built up a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a portfolio of companies which are in there. We're looking at most of them, but we've been able to currently fund only one. Uh, also, there are these water distribution companies, which are especially in the Tamil Nadu region where there is a shortage of water. So we funded companies which are into distribution of water, maybe purification of water and distribution of water. Then comes the next level, which is the SMEs, which are slightly higher ticket size and which are, uh, you know, the, these could be uh, companies which are into the STPs, the smaller STPs, uh, sewer treatment plants. These could be also into, uh, yeah, you know, uh, 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 the same water purification as well. And uh, uh, so we have, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to say that we've looked at a lot of companies and we are, we have a robust pipeline over here. We funded a company which is into manufacturing of community toilets and uh, it's been over a year. We, uh, we've not faced any issue. In fact, we've helped this company with our lending, not only create, uh, uh, put up more community toilets and more usage, but also making them uh, now, more financially included in the sense that they've been able to raise a ECB uh, from foreign institution and, and bringing them to that level. Uh, so this is also one of the focus areas that we have, which is lending to SMEs. The third type of product that we have is lending to the MFIs or Section 8 companies or other NBFCs, which are which are smaller in size, which normally would not get uh, you know, funds readily from other institutions for lending in the wash sector. Uh, here also we've tied up, uh, you know, we've partnered with Water.org and, uh, you know, they've helped us in providing technical assistance to these microfinance institutions, uh, tell them about the loan product, uh, uh, set that up and provide training to, to not only to us and to the MFIs, but to the customers as well. Um, here we have funded some MFI and Section 8 companies. Uh, almost 194 women beneficiaries are there who have utilized these limits uh, for construction of toilets and water supply and, uh, and other, or other water and sanitation related uh, you know, services. So this is, this is what we have been able to do while uh, you know, there is a lot which needs to be done, but, uh, uh, but this is the kind of impact that has created. It has helped us in building these products. And now since the foundation is late, it's now time for us to take a step ahead and grow this entire product structure and reach out to more clients in this, in this sector. Um, uh, next slide, please. So what our approach has been basically is that we reached out to a lot of stakeholders and other you know partners in this area we've learned from them because for us also it's an experience you know we were not very uh, conversant with the space being a you know being a young NBFC we did not have a previous experience of the sector we built it from the scratch learned, learned it from these stakeholders try to develop those products and uh, this is what we would like to continue to do, have partner supports like, uh, you know, Apoor mentioned that collaboration is a, is a great way to set up this. And I think we've, we've just done that by reaching out to these stakeholders in this, in this sector. Uh, also having a multi-pronged approach where we do lend directly as well as, as to other institutions to reach out to, to the ultimate beneficiary. Um, so we hope to develop expertise in the sector and uh, obviously the DCA or the USAID guarantee has helped us in, uh, in providing the additionality and taking that risk and jumping into it uh, and being able to build a portfolio here. I just would like to mention that the entire WASH portfolio that we've built for the last one year is performing very well. We've not seen any kind of delay or defaults in the payments. So I'm very happy. I, I'm sure everybody will be will be happy to hear that. 
there are a lot of challenges that we face. Uh, obviously, you know, the uh, I'm sure this is going to be talked much about the government and municipal, uh, you know, receivables, that being a concern. Um, also, uh, you know, there is not a, a readily available pipeline. You have to really go to various stakeholders and kind of uh, see, do the market survey and then, then build up a pipe, pipeline. So not many investable opportunities, you know, which are readily available, uh, which can be taken. So it takes a lot of effort and time to build this up. Uh, also, we have our own limitations because we are not geographically present uh, in the entire country. We have, we have a presence in three states, so we get limited by that. We are also newly set up. Um, also, uh, we don't have the kind of, you know, the balance sheet size which we would like to, to grow this. And hence, uh, liquidity is, is an issue for lending in the sector because rates are competitive. So we do look at, you know, we would look at, want to look at blended finance solutions, which not only are going to help us, but are in the, you know, beneficiary as well. Uh, way forward would be to continue to collaborate with other partners like we've done. Uh, continue to innovate and develop products because this is just the beginning. As we go and move into our journey, we would continue to develop more products. Uh, explore opportunities for blended finance solutions. I think that's that's very, very important because that's that's the way it is going to make this entire sector vi viable. We've done the pilot, we've, we've built it up now. It's it's uh, what we want to take it to the next stage of growth. So that's that's our experience. That's That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minal, and some very heartening news from you. I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> All right, uh, I'd now like to hand over the stage to Shabana to talk about uh, Aquaforo's experience uh, with the Sink for Wash facility. Over to you, Shabana. Thank you, Shubhra, uh, for curating this session and also inviting us to share our work. Um, our pleasure. So today I'm going to be presenting uh, the Social Impact Incentives Program that Aquaforo um, initiated last year. But before I do that, a quick um, introduction on Aquaforo. Aquaforall is a not-for-profit organization based out of the Netherlands, and for almost two decades, we have worked towards catalyzing an innovative, sustainable, and inclusive water and sanitation economy. Uh, we operate in parts of Asia and Africa, supporting innovations and scaling up of enterprises until they're investment ready uh, without distorting the market. Um, in addition, we use our grant funding to mobilize uh, private and public capital to increase investments in water and sanitation. So about the SYNC program, which is Social Impact Incentives for WASH program, uh, we launched and co-designed it last year um, together with Roots of Impact. Roots of Impact is a specialized impact advisory firm working on similar incentive programs across different sectors. In this program, the role was to co-design and structure the incentive schemes and Aqua for All funded the overall program and leveraged its water sector expertise. In addition, we also provided um, outcome funding for the enterprises. So before, um, next slide please. So uh, to just briefly explain to you what exactly the SYNC model is. Uh, SYNC is basically, it's fundamentally a blended finance instrument that rewards high impact enterprises with time limited payments for achieving social impact. It basically acts as an additional revenue stream that directly improves the enterprise's income and with these payments, the enterprise enjoys full flexibility about the type and source of investment to bring in. And the SYNC model really makes it possible to scale without compromising on generating um, stronger positive impact. Something to really um, note here is that one of the closing conditions of SYNC transaction is um, enterprise being able to raise repayable investment. And in this program, we had a goal of um, financial leverage of one to four per transaction. Next slide, please. So some key highlights about this program, uh, we received about 140 applications from 33 countries. Since it was a pilot program, we kept the geographic scope broader uh, and we were offering a ticket size um, outcome funding of 150,000 to 350,000 per company. And the target company uh, for us was, a, was the one in growth stage that was already raising repayable investments. So the current status is that we've uh, finalized two transactions and two are underway. And during this process, we realized that it was really important to also offer some um, need-based technical assistance and that we are also offering to selected companies. Next slide, please. 
Um, to help you understand, uh, you know, the why, what, and how of these incentive schemes, I'll present one of the case, which is of KWASH. Um, next slide. It's a company that is based out of uh, Cambodia and that provides um, um, safe and reliable on-premises pipe water in rural areas. Just for some context, in Cambodia, pipe water is concentrated in the hands of approximately 400 largely inefficient private water operators. And what KWASH does is that it buys and upgrades these water stations, including expanding the pipeline coverage in the area to ensure that the outreach is closer to 70 to 80% uh, within those areas compared to the current average of 30%. So what KWASH does is that it really provides households with access to safe water, which they would otherwise not have. And harder to reach and often lower income households and areas are you know, often left behind because of high investment cost. So what SYNC does is it supports the, um, the company in scaling without compromising on the, this potential impact that they can generate. Um, next slide, please. Um, next one. Um, so with the SYNC, our goal was to really um, reward additional impact and help the company um, also attract repayable capital and ensure that there is impact sustainability. Now to briefly explain to you the table that is on the screen, uh, there will be defined uh, the incentive scheme into two metrics. So the first was about a uh, percentage of connected households in existing stations. So the stations that where they were already operative. And we noticed that the connection rates in the um, two license areas, which were their most mature stations, um, have been significantly improved, but they did not have any further plans to expand further. This is mostly because of the higher investment cost uh, compared to newer stations um, where households were connected closer to the pipe and were the first ones to be connected. So more difficult to reach households, the, and especially the poor ones, are often connected later or not at all. So we concluded that the higher the connection rate, the greater the impact in quantitative and qualitative terms. And that's why this in, uh, metric really incentivizes um, the company to get um, progressive uh, payments for the higher um, effort and achievements that they make. So smaller incentives are provided for growth that do not require, let's say in this case, additional um, coverage, for instance, laying additional pipes in the area and higher incentives are provided for expansion that do require the enterprise to lay additional uh, pipes. So quickly, um, the second matrix in this case uh, for, for this enterprise, um, because they are expanding, because they're getting new uh, license areas, we really wanted to, um, in a way, incentivize, but also challenge um, them to really consider in their decision, deeper impact. And how do we define that? We came up with uh, three criteria. One was percentage of ID poor households in, in, in that particular license area. ID poor households basically is a poverty scorecard system in, in Cambodia that um, enables including more poor households. And then the second was percentage of coverage rate in the area. And then the third was percentage of people with access to clean water. And based on these criteria and percentages, um, new license areas would be categorized as low, medium, and high additionality. And then the SYNC program will only reward medium and high additionality areas to ensure that you know, poorer households are connected and, um, and making sure that those um, stations then further grow in the future as well as part of the business. Next slide, please. So um, just to highlight another aspect of the program and then the SYNC model, it's very enterprise centric and the whole designing uh, of the incentive uh, uh, you know, schemes were based on the input and tensions that the company were facing. So it's not donor driven uh, program, it's really enterprise driven. And we really ensured it and you can see some initial feedback um, from the companies on, on how they see it. And because it's so customized uh, to their needs and the stage they're in, I think the potential of it to um, go further, I mean, with other uh, funders and impact investors is, is huge. Now, um, just to share with you some initial program insights, we're just uh, one year in, into the program and we finalized the transactions earlier this year. Um, we've uh, come to realize that uh, water-focused enterprises tend to be um, you know, stronger sink candidates than uh, sanitation-focused ones. Reason being, um, for sanitation businesses, the business models are not defined, uh, refined, and uh, there is high dependence on grants, and there is a bigger role for uh, pu public um, actors in, in, in their business. 
and thus that limits um, the potential a little bit, but also, you know, they're not really raising repayable investments in most cases. So it's very difficult to find a sanitation company. Although we have managed, um, we're in the process of finalizing a transaction that um, involves a biodigester and its connection with um, toilets. So we're hoping that at least we'll have some initial um, insights on that as well. Um, something else to also mention here that many enterprises that we notice applied for the program are at very initial phases of development and they feature very capital intense uh, models and struggle to find capital. And most of them are highly, of course, reliant on subsidies and grants. And uh, some of them also face uh, strong competition from centralized networks that also limits you know, their scalability. We realized also that the added value of SYNC is really it really needs to be recognized by the targeted community and also the stakeholders and also the investors that uh, put money into these enterprises. Finally, um, next slide, um, just wanna share, uh, we're at, the, um, at this point after finalizing few transactions and looking at the um, additional demand from enterprises, but also other funders, we're looking into scaling the program next year. And we've learned that based on our, our current experience, it requires some iterations. And uh, we feel that because the market is not ready, there needs to be a pipeline. So we'll be focusing a lot on pre-sync technical assistance support to companies. Um, we will also be looking at direct um, TA support for companies that do qualify for a sync transaction. And finally, we're really working on, on um, building a knowledge um, and a, you know, a community on the same concept together with use of impact to ensure that learnings are shared between the enterprises, investors, and potential foundations. So if you wanna learn more about our work and would like to be one of our partners, um, um, happy to uh, connect with you. Um, also happy to share the case documents that we have so you can learn more about the incentive schemes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shavana. Uh, let me now invite uh, Sridhar to talk about uh, Water Equity's experience with uh, Water Credit Investment Fund. Thank you, uh, Shubra. Your slides, please. Yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this uh, slide just tells uh, you about who Water Equity is. So Water Equity is the fund manager, is the asset manager which is solely and exclusively focused on uh, water and sanitation. Uh, we, just to give a background, we are a innovation of water.org, which is a very well-known and renowned uh, not-for-profit. It's been around for more than 20 years around the world. And uh, Water Equity has been selected as one of the top 50 impact investment managers, uh, fund manager for three years, 2019 to 21. Next slide, please. Yeah, now we jump into the fund itself. So Water Credit Investment Fund 3, uh, it was set up in 2018. It's a seven-year fund. Uh, the uh, mandate was to invest in financial institutions and enterprises that increase access to safe water uh, or sanitation services in emerging markets. So the target borrowers are two. One is uh, financial institutions, which predominantly is microfinance institutions. And the second uh, target borrowers are uh, enterprises that are providing water and sanitation products, services, or loans. Uh, two people uh, living below poverty. Uh, the, the priority countries are have been uh, India, Indonesia, and Cambodia. Uh, the fund size uh, is $50 million, and we could invest in CNA debt as well as subordinate debt. The investment sizes uh, are a minimum of $500,000 for financial institutions and $250,000 for enterprises. Uh, and the key metrics, impact metrics that we target are uh, people reached with water sanitation and number of microloans supported, percentage of female clients. Next slide, please. So uh, I just want to uh, briefly uh, want you to look at this uh, structure. Uh, so uh, this is a blended finance structure. We have equity and debt. We have uh, multiple classes of equity. We have class one equity. We have class two equity and a class three equity. And the basic difference is the risk levels. So class uh, one equity has a 20% first loss guarantee. Class two has 10% first loss guarantee. And class three has no first loss guarantee. Of course, class three is mainly the, the, the general partner. Apart from that, we have a loan facilities uh, from a number of investors. And these again have different categories. You know, we have, uh, uh, we have unsecured loans, secured loans, zero interest loans, and uh, low interest loans. And all this, and much of this is backed up by a first loss guarantee. Uh, 
Uh, next slide, please. So how does it work? So we have investors uh, and then we have donors. Uh, investors have invested into uh, Water Credit Investment Fund 3, the fund, which is managed by Water Equity. Uh, but Water Equity also has received some grants. Uh, and, and then uh, these funds in the form of loans, they are provided to financial institutions such as microfinance institutions, as well as to water and sanitation enterprises. And the MFIs in turn provide those funds to the borrowers who in turn provide money to the contractors for getting facilities of construction of toilet or renovation of toilet or a new uh, pipeline access or a water purifier or rainwater harvesting, et cetera. Uh, similarly, water and sanitation enterprises who get money from Water Credit Investment Fund 3 in the form of loans, they provide these to end beneficiaries uh, for uh, creating water and sanitation solutions. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. So uh, this slide talks a little bit about the credit requirements. We have exposure limits at individual level, uh, you know, country level, institution level, and the type of instruments. Uh, and then uh, we select the financial institutions which, uh, uh, which have minimum number of operations and minimum years of operations and uh, number of years of profitability and a certain portfolio size and a certain water sanitation uh, you know, portfolio outstanding, which is $100,000 which we believe is the bare minimum necessary for that institution to scale up. Because we are providing capital basically under WICF3 to scale up water sanitation lending. With regard to enterprises, uh, the requirements are slightly different. Uh, and then we have a number of loan covenants to maintain a portfolio quality. So I'm not dwelling too much on this. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Yeah, so what has happened until now? So after we launched the fund, the first close, the final close, sorry, the final close happened in March, 2019. And over the next 18 months, we have fully deployed uh, the, the funds. Uh, and we now have a diversified exposure. We have 17 investments in this fund. And uh, the portfolio is divided uh, broadly into India 47%, then Cambodia and Indonesia around you know, 29 and 23% respectively. These are the major countries. And we have a diversified exposure in terms of currencies in INR, uh, Indonesian rupiah and US dollars. In terms of instruments, again, it's diversified as senior term loan, subordinate loan, external commercial borrowings in India, and masala bonds, which are rupee denominated bonds in India. So it's a diversified mix of uh, instruments. And the portfolio has been performing so far very well, uh, giving us a return in excess of 3.5%, which is 3.5% is the target, and we are doing better than that, and a 99% repayment rate. Uh, who are the investors? So the, we have multiple types of investors. We have foundations, uh, philanthropic foundations, high net worth individuals, uh, development financial institutions, et cetera. Some of the investors are shown below. Uh, DFC of US, Bank of America, Niagara Bottling, uh, Senia, Hilton Foundation, uh, Skull Foundation. So there are many more. Next slide, please. So what's the impact till date? So uh, if 3 has reached more than 1.2 million people uh, with safe water and sanitation. Uh, it has re, uh, 247,000 plus uh, micro loans to low-income uh, consumers. More than 96% of end clients are women. And uh, we are strongly uh, targeting uh, SDG 6. Next slide. So in this slide, we talk about what are the key learnings from this fund. So this is divided into three parts. The first part is success in fundraising. No, I think this was a very big exercise for us. It took a very long time. Uh, we created a capital structure that addressed expectations of different classes of investors. We have a blended finance structure with philanthropic capital playing a pivotal role. Uh, and we have a very clear focus on SDG 6, that is water and sanitation. Uh, we were really helped by the fact that water.org enjoys a huge amount of credibility in the sector that really helped us when we went out for fundraise. And we had a very clearly articulated investment strategy. Now, when it comes to impact, I believe we have created very good impact. And this success in impact was uh, the result of uh, a few factors such as a water.org partnership. That is most of the investees have received or continue to receive technical assistance from water.org, uh, number one. Number two, we ensured that the uh, financial institution that we're financing, the top management is committed to water and sanitation lending. And the next point is that we set very clear targets, very clear KPIs for uh, our borrowers to fulfill so that uh, you know, everyone, everyone is clear on what uh, needs to be achieved. And the last point uh, is success 
in portfolio performance. Uh, we created a very strong and clear credit policy, uh, which focused on credit risk and, and minimizing credit risk. And uh, just one moment. Yeah, uh, then a thorough and meticulous due diligence process. We have a very meticulous due diligence process, which, uh, which really uh, we spend a lot of time and we collect a lot of information and do a lot of analysis. Uh, so that really helped us in understanding uh, our borrowers very well. And finally, we have a very strong investment management team with a lot of experience in financial institutions. I believe these are some of the uh, reasons why we have been successful and, and uh, these are the key learnings. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is the last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sridhar. I think that was a brilliant mix of uh, some uh, wash financing facilities that we've seen today, and I'm very excited to, to very quickly jump into the, uh, the discussion on learnings from these. I'll hand over to you, Apoor. Thanks a lot, Shabran. Thanks a lot, everyone else, uh, for those great presentations. Uh, I see there are a few questions that have started coming in from uh, the other participants also, so we'll try to knock some of those out of the park as well uh, through the panel. Uh, so uh, let me uh, start quickly and go to uh, uh, Shabana uh, for uh, everyone else. Uh, you know, uh, it, SYNC always uh, has been a very intriguing instrument uh, for us also when we Right to see that you know it really combines two things. One is uh, you know the donor's preferences to you know pay only for impact and get the maximum value for money, but you know it's also unique in the sense that it helps uh, catalyze some of the other private investors to invest in these enterprises also. Right. So uh, what uh, I I want to start with uh, some one specific question around uh, you know the uh, the scalability and replicability of this, and I think one key component that we've seen. A lot in India is around uh, you know the overhead uh, costs and you know you spoke about uh, monitoring and evaluation specifically for one of the examples there and how you customize it actually on an enterprise level. Uh, can you you know throw some light on how you do that and how you actually keep the or you know how do you balance between that high cost of MEL and that scalability and replicability question? Um, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I think something that I missed explaining when I was explaining the SYNC model is that there is an impact verifier involved that actually collects the relevant data and also uh, checks on their impact measurement and management systems to ensure that there is process in place to collect the right data for us to then be able to pay for the outcomes that they generate. Um, in terms of the cost, um, so far, um, um, for us, it hasn't been um, huge because it also really depends on the verification periods and what sort of baseline data is already there or not. Um, and for us, the rule of thumb is that, you know, the m and &E costs can't be bigger than the incentives that we're providing to the companies. So um, that way, uh, I think we're trying to um, keep the transaction costs, including the m and &E cost, um, to, to minimum at, at this point. But we do have plans actually together with Roots of Impact to really see how can we use technology um, you know, solutions in, in, in more efficient and better ways to reduce the um, cost on M&E that, you know, that, that you incur per company. Is there, is, are there other ways to really verify the data in particular geographies um, uh, that also kind of connect multiple companies and on the different type of incentives we're creating? It's going to be a tough one because the incentives are so customized, but we are working on it. So I think that's what I can um, say right now. And in terms of the data that's collected, it's mostly through interviews and also quantitative data. So we really not just want to uh, focus on the matrix itself, but we also want to see their overall system and how that is improving. So we also use the um, CED checklist to ensure that all the result, um, you know, chain and other aspects of the metric are taken care of. So I hope that helps. Thanks a lot, Shabana. No, that's that's a valid point, and I think that balance is uh, very important to create on some of these pay for success uh, mechanisms. And good to see that you know uh, you're really thinking about it, and you know would be really happy to see how things progress and how what what this eventually comes out to be. Uh, I'll move on to uh, you know Sri the next, and she was uh, the last one to go. And I see as uh, a, a question. Uh, from the audience also on this regard around uh, structuring. And I was really fascinated about that one slide you showed uh, Sridhar where, uh, uh, you know, different stacks of uh, capital were there and different kinds of investors with different risk and return expectations uh, were being brought together. 
could you you know talk a little bit about some of the learnings and challenges that you faced uh, in that and how do you manage those multiple classes uh, with different risk uh, return expectations Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I can elaborate on that. So, you know, when we launched this fund, uh, we targeted different types of investors, you know, regular equity investors, impact investors, uh, HNIs, um, BFIs, and so on. But the challenge was that, you know, each of these uh, investors has different risk return requirements. So we realized we have to create different classes of equity and different classes of debt each addressing a specific investor class. So that's where we came up with this uh, preferred equity, you know, which is a class one equity with a 20% cushion of reserve capital with a first loss guarantee for the same amount of 20%. Then we have common equity, uh, you know, with 10% uh, first loss guarantee, and then a manager and general partner, uh, partner equity with, with no cushion of reserve capital because we were managing the whole stuff and, and we didn't need a, you know, FLG. So, so we created different classes. Uh, so through which uh, of equity through which we could attract these different class of equity investors. Now, when it comes to debt, again, we, you know, uh, we, we got some low interest loans. We also got zero interest loans. Uh, uh, we got some loans which are unsecured uh, uh, and then some which are secured by first loss guarantee. So we actually, I had to kind of blend and uh, match uh, these and, and that was possible because of the availability of uh, first loss guarantee. Now, you know, how did we get, uh, how, how does a first loss guarantee mechanism work? So these first loss guarantees are backstopped by philanthropic funding, which is raised by water equity. If you see that, uh, if you remember that slide where uh, water equity directly raised uh, grant funding, that was basically used for providing first loss guarantees. And they can be drawn down at the end of the fund if there's a shortfall in meeting the return expectations or return guarantees that we have provided. So, uh, so this is the way uh, it was all put together. So I would say the success in raising this fund owes a lot to proper understanding of the risk return appetites of different class of investors and, and addressing those needs, basically. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sridhar. And this is, uh, you know, a good segue for me to go to Antua next also, because, you know, that's, that's another fund uh, which has uh, different types of capital providers with different risk return expectations. And I'll you know, uh, want to pose the same question to you on how you've, uh, you know, brought those together and how you're managing them. But, you know, also uh, going towards the deployment side a little bit, you know, equity is not a, uh, not an asset class, at least in India, that's uh, seen a lot of traction uh, in the water and sanitation space. Um, and, you know, that tends to be a lot of challenges by, and, and reasons why this hasn't happened. But I really like your point around, you know, the need for patient capital for, you know, some of these nascent, uh, subsectors within WASH and equity seems to be a good fit. So I'd also, you know, one obviously is on the structuring, fund structuring side, but also on the deployment side, you know, how uh, have you been looking at uh, different subsectors within WASH and what are some of the things that you look for in a company uh, when you invest in them, knowing the, you know, background challenges that the sector faces? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this question. So um, I think um, there is a lot of appetite from the private market. Uh, but to uh, start with inception of the of the WAF, so it first came from a reality check. So three out of ten people do not have access to safe drinking water. But at the same time, the private equity water investing is still very nice, and so that there is an obvious market inefficiency, uh, which doesn't match with the number of companies that we see on the market and that lack of, of financing. And this is particularly true when it comes to our segment of the WAF, the so smaller size projects um, operating as for-profit businesses, but that do not necessarily have access to that financing when there is no uh, capacity to pledge assets and uh, when the financing profile of water businesses simply do not permit to reimburse that installment. So then equity products might become a subsidiary solution uh, to bridge this financing gap uh, for these water businesses and help them scale with patient capital. Um, having said that, it's still fair to say that investment readiness uh, requires uh, more time than in traditional private equity. So institutional investors need uh, to be convinced more than usual uh, by the financial viability of water businesses. So for this, uh, we conduct extensive due diligence on the business we look into and we consider all aspects from um, a technical point of view, uh, but also environmental and social matters, 
and, and also try to make realistic assumptions on, on business plans. Um, so with the WAF, I hope we, we, we are demonstrating that we, it is actually possible to put together an initiative uh, that is an innovative planet finance facility that brings around the table different categories of investors with different expectations. So uh, it includes impact investors, uh, family offices, public development banks, alongside uh, strategic investors that for some of them will provide first loss strength for the fund. Um, so while, while expected returns uh, may be on the lower end of traditional private equity, we're still targeting a 15 to 20% return per annum on our investments. And we believe this is underpinned by uh, a vast amount of young uh, emerging companies in Africa and Asia that have uh, ambitious and innovative entrepreneurs that are leading them. Uh, but it's, it's simply the, the capital that is, that is lacking in order to finance capital expenditures. So this is perhaps a situation comparable with uh, maybe microfinance institutions like 20 years ago. And just like back then, uh, Incofin wants to play a catalyst role and help pioneering water sector to achieve scale, uh, reinforce the water ecosystem and, and, and target returns that will uh, attract specialist investors or strategic players for maybe, we hope, next rounds of financing uh, to whom we could sell our participation and aim for further consolidation uh, of the water business uh, through mergers and acquisitions or potentially uh, listing uh, on the stock market. So we've seen that uh, in India for the most resilient ones. So um, yes, to answer your question, I, I believe it is today possible and, and, and the market is showing appetite for that uh, despite some inherent complexities that the fund will need to tackle. That's, that's really encouraging to hear. And my next follow-up actually was going to be around, you know, what kind of exits you're expecting, but you answered that uh, already. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, some of these learnings can be picked up by a few investors in India as well to start up, uh, you know, uh, an equity fund for water uh, and sanitation. So, you know, thanks a lot, Antoine. Uh, I'll move to Meenal and uh, just, uh, you know, touch upon one of the things she also briefly touched upon in her presentation, but uh, you know, one of the challenges that we've heard uh, with, with you and, uh, you know, some of the other financial institutions that we work with through our guarantees also has been pipeline building and sourcing investable uh, enterprises. Can you, you know, talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges you faced there, how you've uh, been able to actually, uh, you know, get a few investable models uh, and do they specifically like, you know, in uh, like how Shabana was mentioning, uh, water tends to be a little more uh, where, where they've been able to find more investable enterprises. Has this been the case for you as well? You know, there are some certain sub-segments where, you know, you're, you're seeing more uh, pipeline. Yeah, uh, Apurva, like I mentioned, you know, uh, uh, th this, is, this is a huge challenge for us or for any institution who's starting to lend in this space, A, understanding this space because there's too many businesses, you know, uh, you pick up one and then there are there are a hundred more type of businesses that are there in the space. So water in itself is a, is a huge space and sanitation and then hygiene. So what we, uh, you know, this is, this is obviously one of the biggest challenge in building the pipeline. What we're trying to do is trying to break the space into, uh, you know, similar businesses or cohorts and uh, develop business models and design products, uh, you know, uh, basis the, the cohorts or similar nature of businesses which are there. Um, so that's one way of doing it, but still, I think uh, uh, we, are, we are still learning. We are still learning. We found some businesses that we would want to be piloted and we would want to take forward, you know, especially which are into distribution of water and maybe water purification. Uh, into sanitary napkin manufacturing. Uh, we're still not very sure on these sewage treatment plants because uh, A, because of, uh, you know, the obviously dependence on government receivables as well as uh, COVID being another issue, not many municipalities are, playing, are paying and hence, you know, uh, delving into the space, we're a, we're a little apprehensive, but uh, we're trying to find uh, ways and means of, of developing this, uh, this side of uh, a business as well. Uh, the other challenge that we have is that the companies that we come across, uh, you know, in this space are at a very nascent stage and, uh, you know, they're not really debt ready. 
So they probably do need some kind of equity, some kind of technical assistance to make them reach a stage and size where they, where, you know, debt is a possibility. So uh, why instruments like, uh, you know, credit guarantee do help us in taking some call, but uh, getting this, uh, this entire industry to a stage where it is, it is debt ready is, is still, I think, a challenge. So when I speak to maybe say 20 companies, I'll find about two which are really, you know, uh, investable uh, companies. So that's that's the major challenge. However, you know, we are trying to identify pockets and areas where, you know, we have piloted and we would like to grow these sectors. Um, so that's the that's what our approach has been, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to add more and more businesses as we move forward, as we understand the sector, as we have, you know, more uh, partners who are able to guide us as well, and uh, you know. Take that, take that first step for, you know, to learn more and build up the sector. So that's, that's my, uh, you know, that's our experience. Thanks a lot, Neil. No, that's helpful to know and, you know, good to hear uh, both equity uh, and uh, technical assistance being important uh, to kind of get some of those nascent uh, enterprises moving up the curve uh, to be debt ready. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just move to Sridhar now. And, uh, you know, picking up from what you just said, Neenal, on, uh, uh, you know, some of the challenges you face in, uh, build, uh, you know, getting a pipeline of investable enterprises. And Sridhar, you folks look at, uh, you know, like you uh, mentioned, both uh, other MFIs and financial institutions to online uh, or to direct beneficiaries, but also enterprises. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you approach these two differently and, you know, maybe some of the challenges that you face on, uh, uh, sourcing really the enterprise, uh, but we know the financial institution model is still something that, uh, you know, has uh, taken, has been scaled up and is now being taken up by a lot of folks, but, you know, how do you really balance between these two? Uh, sure. Uh, Apo, uh, yeah. So uh, there are challenges absolutely, even in the financial institution model, but let me first talk about the financial institution model and then I'll go to the, uh, uh, enterprise model, the challenges there. So in the financial institution model, uh, you know, uh, often we find that uh, there is a mismatch between the financial profile and the impact profile. You know, sometimes we find a very strong financial institution, uh, credit risk wise, they're very good, but then impact, on impact, they're not as impactful. You know, when we say impact, they need to be, uh, you know, they should be reaching, uh, you know, low income households and they should be providing uh, access to water and sanitation. So they, you know, they perhaps are not so good in the impact aspect. The contrast is also true. There are institutions that are not very strong financially, but who have a very strong impact profile. So it's really challenging to find that mix of, you know, uh, financial risk and impact profile to, you know, to, uh, to lend to. That's one. The other point is uh, often we find that there is no top management buy-in in the in the financial institution. Uh, the CEO or the top management really not uh, focused on impact, so that becomes a challenge. So we we ensure that there is a buy-in from the top management to uh, water and sanitation. See, because what happens is often financial institutions are very large; they are hundreds of million dollars, and then water sanitation portfolio is actually a small uh, portion. So often it doesn't get the attention that it deserves. So that's the second challenge we find. So we ensure that there is a top management buy-in. Uh, another challenge often we find uh, is uh, this is more for small to medium enterprises, but also sometimes a larger institution is, is that the institution wants to scale up, but they don't have the ability, they don't have the capacity. So in such cases, what we do is uh, we try to bring in where possible our sister organization, Waterdog, which is uh, really fantastic in this area, and we get them to uh, support us by providing a technical assistance to the institution. Uh, you know, so that we try to do that from time to time. Uh, another uh, very important point uh, in institutions is that uh, there is a, you know, there's a tendency for loan misutilization. Mis you know, the institution lends to low-income borrowers for building a water sanitation access, but then the money is used for something else. So we have to ensure that the misutilization is minimal. So, so we need to put in tracking mechanisms and monitoring mechanisms to ensure that that's on track. Otherwise, you know, the impact that we believe we are creating is actually not getting created. So this with, with regard to financial institutions, uh, when it comes to enterprises, now see the biggest challenge we face is to find profitable and scalable business models, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, that we can support. So often the challenge is there's a very good business idea and we really like it. 
but the challenge is uh, like what Anton said, you know, these businesses are not generating steady cash flows. So they're really not ready for debt yet. They're probably equity investment opportunities, but then in Wikip3, we are providing only debt. So that becomes a mismatch and very, we feel very sorry to see them go because we really can't support them until we are able to do equity. So this is the biggest challenge in, uh, you know, with the enterprises. Thanks, you know, really echoing what uh, we also mentioned and, you know, thanks for providing that additional context around financial institutions as well. And you're right, you know, water.org uh, does play a very pivotal role in a lot of uh, such facilities across India. You know, uh, I'm sure Meenal and others uh, who, uh, you know, we have guaranteed with, uh, have extensive, uh, a good experience of working with those also. So, yeah, I think, and I'll come to just this, some of these solutions, technical uh, assistance related bit uh, in just a second. I want to go back to uh, Shabana um, and uh, maybe a, a two part question here. Uh, one, you know, uh, I, you, you did touch upon it uh, towards uh, some part of your presentation that, you know, one key uh, consideration for you is to get these enterprises ready for uh, commercial capital after, uh, uh, you know, they exit. Can you? Talk a little bit more about that sustainability plan and essentially, you know, how when donor support ends, uh, uh, which are, which is essentially, you know, could be uh, looked at uh, either reducing the cost of capital uh, for, for what they're uh, taking on or, you know, even improving their equity position or helping them do other things. What happens when that support from, say, SYNC or uh, another instrument ends? How do they get to, you know, commercial uh, capital? Right, that's a great question. Um, so I think in our current uh, pilot, uh, we really um, intentionally chose companies that were in the process of raising repayable investment. And as a condition, they had to raise that money for us to then give them the incentive uh, for higher impact. So the, the question has two parts. One part is sustainability of the impact itself. So once we um, uh, uh, you know, uh, are out of the, the transaction, the impact continues because these um, new clients are their new paying clients. So they will continue to serve them in a sustainable way and they don't need us anymore. What they do need as enterprise is more funders who can pay for more future impact by making newer clients. So I think it has that aspect. And I think what we're uh, on the second part of your question about you know, enabling them to raise um, in future even more capital, I think that's a part that we have not really looked into because these companies have their own growth plans, they have their own investment um, raising strategies and stuff. And this hasn't come across as a, a challenge as of now uh, because these are really growth stage companies and they have a better view. And I think that's an area we may step in later on if we see that you know, with the current companies, the incentives we have provided them, can we work with them again with bigger ticket size incentives and then challenge them to raise, you know, now we were asking them to raise a one to four, um, you know, ratio um, of, of a repayable investment. Can we challenge them to raise, you know, uh, one to eight or one to 10? Now, those are some considerations we're already thinking about at this, at this moment. But in terms of sustainability, yes, it's a very uh, kind of crucial aspect uh, on what exit strategies are already there for them and for us. And how do we sort of um, make it work as the transaction comes to a close? And we're still at the start, so very happy to dive deep into it as we kind of move forward. Thanks, no, that's that's helpful to at least understand the broader hypothesis and uh, you know how you're seeing it, and uh, good to hear that. And you know, I'm going to move quickly now. Don't have too much time left. I'm going to move to Antoine next, uh, and also you know picking up on the same theme around uh, sustainability and some of the earlier things that both Sridhar and Meenal have also mentioned around technical assistance. You know, technical assistance is a big part of uh, what you're doing through your fund as well for uh, the enterprises. Can you talk a little bit about how you customize that, what kind of technical assistance gets provided and how that's really, uh, you know, helping these companies become more invest investable for you? Yes, thank you for the question and uh, indeed, Technical assistance is, is for the fund an absolute central piece in the value proposition of the WAF. So Incofield has secured a sizable facility to be mobilized upfront when water businesses need our support in specific areas to facilitate our investment in the company, but also during the monitoring phase after our investment in order to keep following actions that require monitoring over time. 
or simply because we recognize that businesses will need uh, our support in different areas and some of them could emerge as businesses uh, would grow and face new challenges. So um, typically the technical assistance will be provided in line with uh, the stages of development of companies and will consider the specificities of each company focusing on certain key areas. So to, to name a few, uh, it could be applying an appropriate management system to the production of uh, safe drinking water. So including uh, collection, storage, purification, waste. Could be identifying gaps in complying with quality standards, uh, ensure high quality water, considering the different types of contamination in a specific area. Or we could also try to tackle uh, business strategy and cost efficiency. So this could include uh, conducting a full operational and financial diagnostic, trying to identify weaknesses and priority actions, designing an action plan, and um, provide some, some KPI monitoring. Uh, could be also, I uh, could imagine, in supporting the financial planning, cost optimization, the management of risk. And as you know, as business will scale, uh, there will be a rollout of the model with setting up uh, new water stations, for instance, or government, uh, governance related issues. So I could imagine this could be one aspect also important. And then on the environmental and social side, uh, clearly we will put an emphasis on that. And the TA can help us to make uh, ENS diagnostics of water productions and uh, management systems, could help us uh, conducting studies to identify pollution sources in the region, analyze gaps in the system to remove contaminants, could be also um, a very important topic, designing and implementing recycling strategies for plastic water bottles, or one of our strategies is also to try to uh, make our companies uh, through a review, revenue stream uh, benefiting from carbon credit systems. So we could have also that possibility to implement uh, such a strategy with, with TA. And then obviously trained staff uh, at, at Incofin level, but, but also uh, um, at underlying company level uh, on the implementation of ENS programs and solutions. And then lastly, I think I, I would finish with one important uh, point that is uh, building knowledge sharing and awareness raising. So building effective, um, effective marketing campaigns and awareness about the benefits of safe drinking water among the customers and local communities. Could be also delivering thematic workshops, seminars and training to enhance the best ENS practice. So yes, I think TA could be a very useful tool, uh, tool in order to uh, help increasing investment allocation towards the water sector. And I think all our investors are asking for it and are very interested in us mobilizing the facility, not only to create intrinsic value in the water business we would invest in, but also as a risk management tool. And also by adopting a more sustainable approach in the way investors look into the portfolio. Uh, so you can clearly see that uh, it is now on top of the priority and that returns cannot be achieved alone and that there is a very strong desire to go beyond that. So this, this grant resource for TI is absolutely key and uh, is, in my view, an, an essential piece of the value proposition of the wealth for our investors. Thanks, Antonio. That's, that's really heartening to hear. Uh, and, uh, you know, from what you mentioned, it's a fairly comprehensive and also customizable uh, TA that you do while also, you know, doing uh, the, the usual enterprise building or enterprise uh, uh, you know improvement that you would do probably for all your investors and i think that that's really uh, echoes well with uh, what everyone else has also said around the need for ta and also that customizability uh, uh, that is needed for different kinds of enterprises uh, i'll go to nina lex and this is something that came up uh, as uh, one of the audience questions also and i also had this on mind uh, you know around the uh, the high dependence of enterprises, at least in India, at least, you know, a large chunk of what you look at, uh, high dependence on government receivables. And, you know, uh, in certain cases, there being delays to those receivables. So how have you uh, been trying to tackle that problem? And, uh, you know, does a partial credit guarantee actually help you venture into some of these, uh, you know, high government uh, dependent uh, sectors also? And, you know, if not a guarantee, uh, would you have, uh, you know, do you think other structures uh, are needed to be put in place uh, by donors, other, uh, 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 you know, regulators, et cetera, to help, uh, you know, lend more to these enterprises? So essentially a two-part question, you know, how 
you've been dealing with that or have you been dealing with that at all and secondly you know uh, what more in terms of structures uh, uh, can we look at in india uh, maybe you know something like a first class that shridhar is looking at or you know uh, a host of other blended finance yeah uh, thanks apoor i think uh, that's a very very pertinent question and uh, being in the sector this is one of the major problems that this sector is facing and definitely you know as an institution wanting to lend in this sector we also have come across this challenge um yes to your first question uh, you know definitely this guarantee does help us in in taking a look at uh, you know companies which have high dependence on uh, government sector receivables um i just want to add to my experience of having worked in you know even multinational banks as well as private sector banks uh, uh so maybe you know structuring your uh, your product offering also does does help in in a manner in which the risk does get mitigated to a certain extent so having you know escrow mechanisms where you are ring fencing and capturing cash flows from these common receivables also the other thing that you know i personally have applied in in this uh, in the in the deal that we have done is provide a longer tenor loan uh, because there are so many uncertainties you know so i just wanted to you know give that example when we lent to the sme you know the cash flows showed that you know the repayment can be made in 18 months uh, but uh, we were quite insistent we told the promoter you know the advantages of taking a longer tenor loan and if they get stuck with these receivables then they should not default on the repayments to the institutions and uh, instead of a 18 month we gave them a 36 months loan and sure enough you know during covid period i think that became very helpful because the emis were smaller you know the company was able to honor the commitments and not uh, despite of having delayed you know payments from these municipalities and and government organizations they were able to pay us on time So just a little bit of structuring uh, the the guarantee ring fencing receivables i don't have a magic wand to it but uh, but these are some of the things that can be done um, you know to to mitigate the risks that are present also you know if there is a dependence on one large project then then i think that should be that should be really avoidable because uh, if those receivables uh, you know do get stuck then there is very little there's no there's no mitigant available so from uh, from that perspective yes these are some of the things that can be done uh, you know to mitigate the risk that are present uh, a lot needs to be done obviously you know from government perspective as to how do you make the you know uh, ensure that the payments are made in time one way i think was to rate these municipalities or rate the instruments that they are raising we did try to you know look at various sites whether the rating was available so we could have some kind of track record and we should be able to do it and that also puts a lot of discipline into these municipalities that you know rating is there but unfortunately either you know these are not dated they are they are uh, you know withdrawn or or those kind of ratings are no longer there so uh, having uh, you know uh, uh, additional uh, support by way of uh, either you know first class default guarantees or uh, you know other structures i think uh, would would go a long way in lending more to the sector so so that is that is my take on it that's my experience and that is what we've done and we we successfully at least lent you know we we started lending even with government receivables that's great to hear you know len i i know you know we've uh, been working in this space to try to uh, solve some of these non financing challenges that you know uh, end up being challenges for financial institutions eventually and you know clearly some movements are being made but we need to do a lot more and you know some of the structures like first loss interest subvention uh, maybe even a receivables fund uh, you know could be uh, you know a potential solution that we could look at and completely agree with you on that one um i i think we're almost running out of time i'm just going to pick up one question that i think is pertinent for uh, all the facilities that we showcased here and hence all the panel members uh you know this is around ensuring gender uh, inclusive uh, investing practices gender lens investing can you uh, you know quickly maybe just take a minute each and talk about how uh, you know your facility uh, your specific facility looks at gender, gender lens investing i'll start with shabana and then uh, meenal antoine and shridhar 
Um, a great question. I already actually responded on the chat. So I think for us, um, the gender lens uh, is very important as, uh, as well as the climate lens. And in our new program, we're going to specifically try to understand how can we create incentives for enterprises on these two fronts. Because in our current program, we the metrics that came out of the work that enterprises do did not touch upon these. So we really have to make some additional effort there. And um, as Apple for All, we've also looked into a time-saving model to monetize the time that women save by not going to fetch water, um, et cetera. But this work needs some, uh, some exploration. And you also notice that enterprises, they broadly are social enterprises. They do know rough impact, but when it comes to actual data and how do you systematically create an impact measurement and management system, that's not in place. So our goal also in the new program is to have technical assistance support specifically on IMM. Um, yes, that's what I can say for now. Nina? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as an institution, uh, you know, we are quite conscious of uh, providing access uh, or to finance to women entrepreneurs. So uh, we have put in some schemes where there is interest subvention for women entrepreneurs. Also, the wash sector itself, you know, if you see the water provisions, you know, the water distribution, it does save time for women. So it is kind of inbuilt uh, in itself. The sector itself provides that, uh, you know, gender lens. Uh, also, we try and pool in co-borrowers, which are, uh, you know, women. Uh, so if you're lending to a, to a male entrepreneur, then we try and ensure that the woman is also involved in that entire loan process. So at an institutional level, plus, uh, you know, the sector itself providing that uh, gender lens, I think uh, that what, that's what takes care of this, this aspect of, uh, you know, lending. Anton? Yeah, so um, quickly, we, we uh, will track this uh, impact metric, and this is clearly uh, a very important one for us because most of our investors uh, in our fund are actually asking for it, and uh, uh, we, we, we would like to be part also of uh, what we call a TOEX uh, challenge, so uh, making sure that uh, women uh, uh, can, can benefit from, from our investments, and I believe this can be done uh, at two, at two layers. So one layer is, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, providing um, a capacity to access safe water into the homes uh, will uh, prevent uh, women to uh, make long distance in order to, to, to find safe source of water. So uh, it's really one example that uh, will uh, generate strong impacts for women also when it comes to education. And uh, the second aspect, and uh, this was mentioned also before, is that uh, we, we, we look into uh, also women entrepreneurship. And uh, we have had very good examples, for instance, of, uh, of water kiosk uh, in, in Ghana, but there are many of others, uh, where uh, women entrepreneurs have been actually very successful. And uh, I think employment is, is, is one, one key way in order to uh, um, integrate uh, women uh, uh, in order to, to make sure that not only for them, they can earn an income, but also uh, to, to uh, hire uh, more women uh, in these companies and make sure that they, uh, they really uh, get included uh, in, uh, in the financial society. Shida? Yeah, sure. I think it's a good question. Uh, and because for us in water equity, uh, gender is a very important lens through which we evaluate uh, our investment deals. Uh, two levels, I want to mention this. So one is, of course, at the end customer level, especially when we are lending to financial institutions. Uh, you know, you saw my presentation about water equity. Uh, nearly 96% plus of the end clients are women. So it's a, it's a very strong focus for us. Um, so that's, that's absolutely... Uh, you know, that's the case. Uh, and uh, with regard to, you know, the, the next level is, uh, you know, when we are lending to a financial institution or to an enterprise, we look at the gender lens even within those organizations. For example, uh, in our borrower organization, uh, you know, how much of the board of directors is women, uh, top management, uh, you know, the, at the ma executive management level, how many women are there in the overall workforce, how many women are there? Are there non-discrimination policies? Are there policies that encourage uh, the uh, employment of women? And so on. And uh, we, we take up a discussion with the management. When we find there's a deficiency, we do take up a discussion with the management and nudge them. I mean, at the moment, we only nudge them. Uh, we nudge the management into 
you know, um, uh, you know, more gender equal uh, workplace. So these are the two levels at which we take it. And we have a ESG scoring mechanism where uh, gender lens is a very important aspect. So it, it, it's core to our business. Thanks a lot, everyone. This was super helpful. I'm just going to turn back to Shubra and uh, see if we uh, have any other questions from the audience that you want to take at this time. Uh, I think uh, there's one we could just one second. Yeah, there's one which is uh, again addressed to the panel as a whole that uh, are there any fundraising suggestions for uh, small and growing businesses that are too large for microfinance uh, uh, and revenue generating, but not enough uh, revenue to meet requirements of impact investors. It's coming from an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think that's a great one. And I think a great one to conclude the session also to get everyone's uh, you know two cents on that, just maybe two top lines from everyone. Um, so why don't we start with you, Sridhar, then I'll go the other way around this time. I'm sorry, uh, I, I missed the question. Sure. Shridhar, the yeah. question is, uh, are there any fundraising suggestions for small and growing businesses that are too large for microfinance uh, and possibly uh, you know, their revenue requirements are too, too less to, for, for impact investors? Uh, I would say um, you know, there should be a good business model. It could be small, uh, that's, that's fine, but uh, uh, a business model that is well thought out uh, with diversified uh, revenue streams. Uh, I just give an example. Uh, you know, you could have a water, uh, you know, retail business which is totally, you know, uh, supplying to the CSR market. Uh, you know, which is not very replicable. Whereas, if you have water as a provision as a solution uh, rather than selling the machines, you know, that's a much more sustainable solution. So, so look at sustainable, scalable solutions. Uh, which generate more steady revenue streams. I, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, fundraising is going to be that much easier. Anto? Um, yes, we, we, we are looking for enterprises that have a demonstrated capacity to scale. So I wouldn't say it's a, it's a big issue if the business is small, as long as there is a, uh, a clear indication on how the company will be able to uh, break even in the short time uh, with, with, with our equity. And um, I think the, the, the entrepreneur need, needs to be clear about uh, financial reporting. So this one will be absolutely key and, uh, um, and how uh, he, he will also, you know, make sure that um, a shareholder like us uh, will, will, will be able to provide added value by, you know, becoming an active shareholder in order also to, 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 to make some knowledge sharing. And um, if we go on the, on, on the product side, um, I believe that one key aspect is uh, um, commercial affordability of the service in the long run. So typically returns cannot be made by uh, increasing tariffs, uh, but rather with organic growth by generating higher volume and better cost control. And I think I would like to stop on that one because it's very important. Um, this can be achieved two ways, um, either by reaching economies of scale, so higher volume will help absorbing the fixed portion of operational costs. But we also see a lot of potential in the uptake of cost-effective technologies. So for instance, uh, metering technology is one example, uh, smart pumps, which would allow better productivity, or for example, PVC pipes uh, that will reduce non-revenue water. Um, so Ultimately, these benefits um, can, can be also in terms of human resources to uh, effectively um, uh, control um, uh, costs uh, at multiple standpoints, uh, but also for better water resource management. So I think there is a lot of potential around that uh, to, 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 to answer your question. Thanks. Uh, Meenal, yeah. just a quick word maybe. If I've understood the question correctly, it is that, uh, you know, the entities which are too large for a microfinance to consider them for a, for a debt financing and which are too small for an equity investment, how do they go about uh, going their growth plan? Is, uh, have I understood the question correctly? How do they go about fundraising? That, that's correct, Meena. That is typically what a micro enterprise is because it is a level above microfinance and it is, it is not yet ready for an, for an equity investment. 
So institutions like us do specialize in, in funding micro enterprises. So we are happy to, you know, help you in any way for, for any kind of fundraising. Uh, we, we kind of specialize in that area. So, so happy to take that up. Yeah. Great. Uh, um, and uh, Shabana, the final word uh, to you. Alrighty, so I, I think there are two things. Um, I mean, just on a broader question, I think if you're too small for microfinance and too big for, um, no, too big for microfinance and too small for impact investors, then if I was you, I would more look into blended uh, fundraising um, you know, strategy. And also if you're not getting funding and if you really wanna build your business, technical assistance is something that uh, donor agencies can offer, which can really help you become investment ready to be able to raise that kind of capital. And then secondly, uh, I would also go with a strategy that allows you to raise money for your commercial scaling versus impact scaling. So you, you may want to divide that and have that kind of strategy in place. Thanks a lot, Shabana. And thanks a lot, uh, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, Shubra, I'll pass it back over to you to uh, close this. Uh, sure. Honestly, it's been a great discussion and a pleasure to have been a part of it. Thank you so much. Totally agree with the poor. Uh, I'd just like to thank all our uh, speakers for coming in and showcasing uh, the facilities and uh, telling us about their learnings. It was very, very insightful. And I'm sure the audience uh, also had a great learning session as well. Thank you for joining. Thank you to the audience also for, for participating. Mm -hmm.